Welcome to Matt Dofty Live presented by Planet Fitness. Join Planet Fitness for $1 down, $24.99 a month. Deal ends June 14th. I'm your host, Nikki Lotterulo. Joining me today is SNY Mets analyst, Keith Hernandez. Keith, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure, Nikki. We're going to start by going around the diamond. After losing two of three to the Giants and being swept by the Dodgers, the Mets pulled out two of four from the Diamondbacks and swept the Nationals. In the process, they have made a flurry of roster moves, which we'll get into later. Keith, what are your biggest takeaways from last week in Mets land? Well, it looks like uh, the team meeting that they had when they hit rock bottom in the homestand, uh, you know, since then they've gone, uh, I believe, five and two, and uh, they scored uh, 36 runs in six games. They're four and two, excuse me. And, uh, that is a sign that the offense is picking up. And, um, you know, Vientos now has been a lot of changes. You've got uh, Iglesia at second base. I think it's going to be a platoon. I don't think that uh, McNeil is going to be benched. It could wind up being a platoon. But, but Iglesia has done a heck of a job. Terenz, who would have expected to get what we got from him in Washington, the two home runs. Uh, and Vientos has gotten his chance. And uh, he's hit five home runs and gotten some big hits. So the offense is starting to click. The pitching was always the issue, the big worry coming out of spring training. Yeah, we'll definitely talk more about all those things you just mentioned coming up later in the show. But let's talk about last Mets off day. We always talk about what the team did on their last off day. They post a lot of pictures of their kids and their spouses. You work a lot of Mets games. You just said you got back super late last night. You're always on the road. What's your ideal day when you do get an off day? My ideal day is um, I don't have to uh, have uh, my dinner at 1230, get in the car at 230, drive an hour and a half to the ballpark and get home after the game at midnight. I can enjoy my, my house out here. I've got a swimming pool. I can relax. I can do whatever I want. There's no preparing for a game and just enjoy the day and have what I enjoy most is I can have dinner with everybody else. The majority of the people that work nine to five and they have dinner at five, six, seven o'clock because we play night games. We're in, I'm on a, I got a night job. So I really enjoy getting in kind of the normal uh, uh, lifestyle when I have an off day. Yeah, I'm the one that gets home from work at 12 o'clock and I'm like eating a full bowl of pasta. I'm like, I can't keep doing this. I need to have the normal dinner time. So I totally feel you on that. Um, let's switch gears to studying David Stearns. President of Baseball Operations, David Stearns, only been with the team a couple of months, but he's shown he's not afraid to make moves when he doesn't like what he sees from the big league club. Most recently, we spoke about it. He demoted Brett Beatty in favor of Mark Vientos, DFA'd Omar Narvaez, brought up Jose Iglesias to take some reps for Jeff McNeil. Would you, how would you evaluate David Stern's management style so far? Well, I like the fact that he, he's made the, the, the decisions and uh, made changes, but he didn't really rush them. And if the team had been playing 500, uh, he may not have made those moves. He may, he, he, and he may have, but um, I still feel like he's feeling his way and uh, getting a sense of the ball club and the personnel and you know he also has to know what's in the minor leagues and um uh you know it, it's i like what i've seen but to me he's just feeling out now we got a whole new uh, we got a new third baseman we've got a now a second baseman we've got another catcher uh alvarez is coming back soon um so i think he's done well been showed a lot of patience because the club really played poorly the last homestand. I mean, in every aspect of the game, they hit rock bottom. So obviously David Stearns is new, also a new manager, Carlos Mendoza. How do you feel he's done so far? How would you analyze um, the last few months with him as manager? I think that Carlos has done a, a good job, a very good job. I, he's he learned uh, as a bench coach over in the Yankees and all those years, and uh, he's ready to manage. I mean, what can you do uh, when you've lost those games the way they've lost, where they've lost games late with leads? No one's lost more games than the Mets. 
late one. What are you going to do? You had a, bull, a starting rotation that didn't go deep in games. And Barry, you know, you got to use the bullpen every day. And um, I think he's done, he's managed with what he's had as well as he can. I'm glad they're starting to hit. And he's finally had some games where, you know, they're blowouts and he doesn't have to manage. He can kind of relax and sit back and, and, and watch the game. But the Mets have played a lot of close, close games and blown a lot of leads late. And those are very demoralizing losses. Yeah, I feel like he's done the best with what he can, like what you said. We spoke also about Jeff McNeil. You said you don't think he's going to stay being benched, but he's not been himself at the plate. He's now being held accountable by Carlos Mendoza and the front office not playing any of the games uh, in Washington, D.C. What do you make of that decision, and what do you think will end up coming of it? Well, we were all surprised that Iglesias didn't make the team coming out of spring training. Mm -hmm. He's a veteran. He's got a great glove. Uh, you know, he's he's not the greatest of hitters, uh, but he's a solid veteran player with a solid glove and a right hand hitter. Um, Jeff hasn't been hitting. He's been hitting the ball in the air too much, way too much instead of line drives. And he's hasn't been hitting and um, no competition is a good thing. They made the move. And uh, Glacius, they had the, the only reason why he got the play is because there was left handers. We had what, yeah. four left handers in a row, I believe. So he got an opportunity to get out there and play every day, and he's done a great job. And the glove is not surprising. He's got a great glove. So uh, I believe it's going to be a platoon, and I think Iglesias is going to play as long as he's productive against left-handers. And McNeil is going to get uh, the opportunity uh, against right-handers. I mean, M Mendoza, Carlos told us in the prior to the series in Washington that they need McNeil to win in with uh, this ball club. So they're not going to quit on McNeil. Yeah. And I think there's nothing wrong with competition. Sometimes you need a little fire underneath you to get you back to, we know he has the talent. So you just got to get back to uh, his basics. So another topic that's always a hot topic here on Mets off day live is Pete Alonzo. So I wanted to get your take as someone who was traded mid season. How do you think a deadline move of Pete Alonzo would impact free agency decision? Uh, well, you're always aware, but a lot of it's just chatter. Uh, you know, there's because he's a big, you know, he's a big, big star, power hitter, prolific power hitter, one of the great power hitters in the game today. So they're always going to be speculation, and you, as a player, you have to just eliminate that. I do feel that maybe Pete, in the beginning, was feeling a little pressure of, you know, because he's, I, I'm pretty sure he's going to up for free agency. I mean, I, I, that's my feeling. And uh, the, the pressure to put up a big number. I think he's been pulling too much and uh, a lot of swings and misses, but he came around in a series in Washington, started hitting line drives and uh, using all the, the right center field. That's when he's going good. The opposite field, the opposite gap. So uh, we'll see how it plays out, but I feel like he's turning a corner right now. And I feel like it, the whole team now is kind of turning a corner. Um, like you said, when you hit rock bottom, there's only one, one way you can go and that's up. Yeah, uh, definitely. They have to be on the come up here. Speaking of the deadline as a former player, how does living on the edge of not knowing whether your team is going to buy or sell impact the clubhouse? Well, uh, I never really had that. I was my, what what happened with me was I was there was rumor I was going to get traded at the trade deadline, and that wears on a player, you know. Particularly when you are with the organ, you haven't been traded before, and uh, you kind of come up in the farm system, and you feel like it's a family, and you don't want to leave, and then you realize when you're traded that it's you know this is a business and blah blah blah. Um, but I don't think that. Um, you know, Pete's going to play every day and it's not going to happen until after the off season. And so he can focus, his focus can be on what he has to do uh, offensively and in the field. And actually he had a pretty nice defensive game last night against the nationals. Yeah. Hopefully he can get the ball rolling. Like you said, there's only one way to go up when you hit rock bottom and something good coming for the Mets is hopefully the return of Francisco Alvarez. If all goes well, he should be back when they return home from London. He's been on the IL since April 20th. They could really use him offensively and defensively. How impactful was the loss of Alvarez on the offensive side? Well, the team wasn't playing well when he was there, and he was hitting 236 and not 
with the power he did last year, which was fine. I mean, he, he's a young player. He's a second-year player. He's not a guy that if, if, if Alonzo went down or Lindor, uh, mm-hmm. that would be very much more impactful. Um, but he's a very important piece of that ball club, and he's got a terrific upside. You need him to be playing and getting more experience out there. So the injury was very, very unfortunate. It's a setback, but he's ready to come back. He's a right-handed bat and um, with power. And he will be a pleasant addition. You know, when you put J.D. Martinez came and finally got put in the lineup, yep. it took him a while to get going because that delayed spring training for him. And now he's hitting. That bat was added to the lineup. Now you're going to have Alvarez back. It's another bat. And the team's hitting. It's clicking now. Uh, they're starting to gel. So it's a very formidable lineup. Yeah, the hot bat hopefully could be contagious. When Francisco Alvarez comes back, who do you think gets the boot, Nito or Torrens? That's a tough one right there. I, uh, uh, Torrens he hit two home runs the last game in, in Washington, and uh, uh, he made two terrific throws to second base uh, throughout, uh, throughout the run or twice trying to steal, something the Mets have had a problem with all year. Yeah. Nito throws well. Nito's a very good defensive catcher. Um, I haven't seen enough of Torrens, uh, Mendoza. He's a four, he's from the Yankee chain and I've got to believe Carlos Mendoza had a lot to do with getting him over into the med organization. He likes him and knows what kind of player he is. So that might be the chip in favor of Torrens, but for me to say which one's going to go, I don't know. I guess the two of them will have some healthy competition between each other to who gets to stay up. Um, all right, let's have a little fun. The Mets are going to London. Let's do a home run derby. Former Mets, former Met Daniel Murphy alongside former Philly Chase Ali will compete in a home run derby alongside BBC Gladiator Stars. In honor of this competition, we want you to draft your all-time Mets home run derby team for players. Who would you put on your roster? Four? Yes. Uh, well, Daryl Strawberry would be number one. Mike Piazza sure. would be number two. Uh, well, and a Pete would be number three, Alonzo. Absolutely. Um, the fourth, uh, maybe it would be Todd Hundley. And out of those four, who do you think would win? <laughs> Putting you on the spot. Pete. I think Pete, Pete. Would, because Pete has won, won a couple already. Yeah. Right? He's used to it. <laughs> He's in our recent memory. So you said Daryl Strawberry was on the list. You were at his number retirement last week. How was that? What were the emotions like? What was the vibe inside the stadium? Uh, the vibe, in, it was a great speech that he gave, by the way. And I think the fans were very heartened by it. And uh, it was great. We had 11 of the former players we played, they had 86 there. And it was just great to see them. Uh, it was great to see Daryl honored. Um, I just thought he gave a really heartfelt, uh, honest, and sincere speech that was very touching. And I think he touched the fans and um, touched their hearts. Uh, it was just a great day. He deserves to be up there. I mean, eighties that eighties uh, the decade uh, with the world championship and the one division title. It's probably the greatest decade, and not probably the greatest decade in Met history. And it was never represented with any player up there. And now there's three and the big three. And the, uh, I'm just thrilled for Doc and I'm thrilled for 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 Daryl. And I'm very proud that I'm up there. So who do you think should join the exclusive club next? David Wright. The captain. Yep. Hopefully, uh, yeah, the, hopefully the list of number retires keep growing. Um, so you're obviously a former player. You're up there. Last week after being swept by the Dodgers, the Mets had a players-only meeting. I'm sure you were part of many players-only meetings in your time. Take us behind the scene. What do these meetings normally entail? I never was a big fan of uh, team meetings because when you have team meetings, it means you're you're playing terrible. You want to avoid team meetings. It's only thing that happens from team meetings is – uh, you're having a, you're going through a negative time. Uh, player meetings. It's usually the veterans that that will be, speak out. The rookies aren't going to be saying anything. They're just going to be all ears and listening. Um, I've had general managers come down in meetings. Uh, I've had the owners come down and have meetings when a team played bad. 
I really don't find that they're all that um, uh, that fruitful. Uh, but I do feel when you have a players meeting only, it's no coaches, no managers, I think more can be done because then the, the air can be uh, cleared and uh, everybody can get their thoughts out there. And, the, and the, that's when the veterans come in and take charge. And it looks like it had a positive effect on this team. Do you feel like the players only meetings usually have a positive effect? No, if, if you're a crappy team, you're a crappy team, <laughs> but this is not a crappy team. <laughs> this, is a, this team's got some talent and they just, I mean, they've just played so poorly. Um, the errors they made uh, in that homestand. I mean, they, they, they're all, they got over 40 errors in the, uh, in the season. And uh, I, be, I don't know if they're tied with the Marlins. I know they, uh, they're they right near them within one or two, or maybe they're tied. Uh, but they've got a – when you're making errors and then you're making base running errors, it's, those are mental errors. Physical errors happen, uh, but I just felt the team was getting tight, and uh, that's why they were committing physical errors. But there's never any excuse for the mental errors. You've got to – no matter how bad you're going, you've got to be focused – on what you got to do when you're on the bases, the situational hitting and all that. So um, I think that in this case, it had a very positive effect and it's right there because they played really, really well since. When you think of this team and you think of the players only meetings, where do you think the leadership is coming from and who do you think it should be coming from? I don't know where it's coming from. Um, I don't have a real good feel for the clubhouse. There's, there's, a, there's a whole nother room where the mm -hmm. players can go and the media is not it's big it's just just as big if not larger than the room where they dress where the media is allowed there's not a whole they're mainly back there i would only have to speculate but uh, it's the veterans and i gotta believe i think jade I, I we heard jd martinez had a lot to say uh a lot of positive input in that meeting and he's a newcomer but he's a veteran that's been mm -hmm. on the world championship teams and He's got, he's got cred, you know, he's, he's respected. So, and he's a quiet guy. So it's always those quiet guys that have to say the little bit and softly that have the most impact. Yeah. I feel like when it's someone you don't expect, when someone says something, it kind of opens everyone's eyes when the quiet ones have a lot to say. Let's switch gears to the bullpen. The Mets bullpen has been brutal to say the least. It was once a uh, strength and now it's kind of become a source of stress. The team has blown eight saves since May 1st. Many more close calls in the ninth inning started with Edwin Diaz blowing multiple saves, ended up on the injured list. Reed Garrett's ERA has gone from a 0 0.72 to a 3.19 in his last seven appearances. Adam Monavino's ERA approaching six after allowing nine earned runs in his last six appearances. Who do you think is this team's best option for the ninth inning with Diaz on the IL? I still say it's 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 Ottavino, and um, you can sprinkle in Garrett, um, have them share the duties. Um, I mean, what really hurt this bullpen was Rayleigh going down. I mm -hmm. mean, he was a quality left-hander, and that really hurt the bullpen. And then also, of course, it was compounded with Diaz just not – uh, to getting it done uh, and when he was in there he was blowing saves uh, so which added to all these demoralizing late inning losses with leads um, I love Danielle uh, uh, so far uh, he has uh, got a good arm um, I'm talking about it's Nunez right and uh, he throws good but I'm not going to put him in a pressurized situation I like whether in the middle of the game seventh inning. he's really bumped up to the seventh inning and he's throwing strikes um it's it's a it's funny that when you have a, a bullpen set up and then you have a closer that you're counting on and then there's in diaz's case where he just collapsed basically and then the seventh and eighth inning guys move up an inning and then you find out if they like it or not. And, uh, and you know, I think when that, uh, it just, we found out that there were some difficulties. Ottavino is not a young man. Uh, he has a tough time pitching two days in a row. 
he's a mystery to me because I like him. And I, to me, he's the guy I'm going to go to because he's a veteran. He's closed before. And I'm going to win or lose with him. When you think about the Edwin Diaz situation, do you think when he comes back from the IL, he can get back to the form he was in? Do you think it's more of a physical thing or do you think it's more of a mental thing at this point? I think it's more mental. I think that uh, he showed a little mental fragility and uh, but all athletes are human beings. You know, some <laughs> guys have, uh, I think that uh, Diaz has shown some fragility and I think it's more mental. I've talked to some pitchers because I don't know mechanics of pitching. And um, so I talked to Ronnie. I uh, talked to the guys around the league that are in the booth now. Uh, Jeff Nelson, when I was in Miami, said he's rushing his motion. And that is whenever you're going bad, everything speeds up. You want to overthrow and and, 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 and hitting you want to, you're too quick instead of everything slowing down. And it it just builds up, it snowballs. And then pretty soon you got an avalanche and you're in big trouble. When he comes back, we'll find out. I don't know uh, how he's going to be. I, he's hurt. Okay, fine. He can rest his arm, but still he's going to have to get out there and, 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 and close games. Yeah, he's got to get back in those pressure situations. And finally, the offense, when it does start rolling and they do have a lead heading into the ninth inning, how demoralizing is it when they can't trust their bullpen to stay in it in the ninth inning? Well, I've been on, I've played on teams that had great offenses and bad pitching when I was with Cardinals, St. Louis. And uh, it is, nothing's worse than not. I mean, if I had my choice, I would take a team like the 69 Mets that didn't have great hitting, but had great pitching. I always take pitching over hitting offense because in the long run in 162 games, you know, it's a season of ups and downs. The offense can't click of over 162 games but if you have good pitching that goes a long way that takes the pressure off the offense you know i'll revert back to our pitching staff in the 80s we knew that if we scored three runs with doc or you know our starting five out there if we scored three runs we're going to win most of the games and that takes a lot of the pressure off the offense so each works hand in hand you know so that's it's a team so mm-hmm. when you have uh, pitching that is giving it up, you know, how many, God, we got five runs. Okay, is that enough? Do we need to get seven? You know, okay, we got eight. Do we need 10? You know, it it it, 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 it compounds and, and it, 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 it puts a little pressure on. So definitely um, pitching is the name of the game. Yeah, especially with an offense like this, you don't want to have to have to get 10 runs every game to win the game. Um, but hopefully... They can get some juice in London. They head to London for two games, the Red Hot Phillies. As we sign off, here is a look at which Mets have mastered their British slang. Keith, For Keith, I'm Nikki Latarulo. Thank you so much for watching Mets Off Day Live presented by Planet Fitness. Join Planet Fitness, $1 down, $24.99 a month. Deal ends June 14th. Keith, thank you so much. We will see everyone in London. Okay. How's your British slang? Not very good. Zero. Oh, man. Can I ask you a couple British terms to see if you know them? And yeah, I'll let's, do the it. let's do it. I, love, I watch Love Island. Let's do it. <laughs> He's going to the bathroom. That's the bathroom. Going to the bathroom. He's going to the loo. No, I'm not going to don't know that. I think that means just going to the bathroom. Um... Quid, quid, quid. Nope. Quid? Money? Like a couple quarters or something? Like it's, oh, I got a little bit of money. Chinwag? No, I don't know that one. That doesn't sound nice. Um, I have to guess it'd be getting punched in the face. Chinwag? Doesn't sound great. Um, uh, smile? You got something on your face. Is that like saying hello? Hunky Dory is like crazy? No clue. No chance. Everything's good. It's all good. I'm upset. Annoyed? Drunk, right? Like I'm tired. T- oh, okay. <laughs>
banter, conversation. It's chatter. Banter's like your riz, like your game. Uh, like talking? Uh, like talking smack back and forth. Cheerio. Cereal? <laughs> Honey Nut Cheerios? Uh, isn't that like pretty much have a good day? Uh, have a good day. See ya. Thank you.